Hi folks, my name is Cole, and I'm a graduate student of immunology. Now, today on Investigate, Explore, Discover, we're going to be looking at a new long-acting injectable HIV drug. So hang around with me throughout this entire video to get all of the relevant background information so we can dive into some exciting experimental results. Plus, at the end, I'll tell you how to get your hands on a free NFT. But to the topic at hand, HIV. Worldwide, it's estimated that about 38 million people are living with HIV, with the majority of people infected living in Southern Africa. Now, HIV infects many different groups of people, but one of the groups that is of most concern is gay men, as they make up the largest individual population of people newly infected with HIV per year. HIV infections progress in many different stages. The first stage of infection is acute infection, which lasts about two to four weeks and is described as one of the worst flus people have ever experienced. After this period, HIV goes into what we call clinical latency, and this is an asymptomatic form of HIV infection that can last for really an indeterminate amount of time. If this goes untreated and this disease continues to progress, it progresses into something called AIDS, Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, and this is where your CD4 T cell counts fall below 200 cells per millimeter cubed. And without treatment, the lifespan of people that have AIDS is about three years. However, we do have treatments for HIV. We can't cure it, but it makes living with HIV no longer a death sentence. So we have many different drugs to be taken daily to suppress viral replication levels. When you treat infections with drugs, there's something called resistance that can arise in the pathogen that you are trying to treat. Resistance occurs when there is not a high enough level to kill all of the bacteria present and random mutations can start to occur. These random mutations get selected for ones that avoid the drug that you're using to treat the infections. So if you use suboptimal dosing or you just get a random mutation, you can have resistance occur. The pathogens, whether they be bacteria or in this case, viruses, these resistant clones start to replicate more and more until they become the dominant population, which means that the treatment that you are using will no longer work. So this is something that we wanna try and avoid. However, there is an issue with taking oral medications daily. Yeah, and this leads to something called drug fatigue. And drug fatigue is where people that are continuing to take medications just get tired of doing so. And it becomes tedious and onerous. Now. I don't have to take any medications every day. I shouldn't be taking my vitamins more, but as it stands, like I do it for a little bit and then I just get tired of taking my vitamins. Now I can only imagine that that is a small scale version of what drug fatigue actually is. All infections have a cost associated with them and HIV is no exception to this. A 2015 study estimated that the lifetime medical costs for an individual who acquires HIV is about 600 thousand US dollars. And as it stands in 2018 alone, people spent $22.5 billion on HIV treatment, where about 65% of people's yearly costs are coming from antiretroviral treatment. Like, that's a lot of money to be spending on this. Now, let's take a step back from what HIV does and look at HIV itself. HIV is a single-stranded RNA virus, also called a retrovirus. The HIV viral replication life cycle has many steps inside of the host cell. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'm just gonna focus on the creation of the viral capsid core. The viral capsid core is made up of HIV capsid proteins, which form hexamers, which are repeats of six proteins together. These hexamers then link together to create the viral capsid core. And this core is important for infectious virions. Now, the drugs that I mentioned that we have against HIV, depending on the drug, work at different stages of the HIV replication cycle to inhibit it and prevent viral replication. I mentioned that HIV infects CD4 T cells, and T cells are part of our adaptive immune response, which is a little bit slow to initiate, but is long-lasting and specific against particular pathogens that it has encountered before. Uh, T cells, as it stands, are subdivided into many different groups, but the one that I really want to focus on today is CD4 T cells. So CD4 T cells become activated when presented with antigen by antigen-presenting cells. 
This initiates different responses depending on how the CD4 T cell is activated. The CD4 T cell can help initiate cytotoxic cell responses, it can initiate antibody mediated cell responses, and it can mediate a cell response pretty much particular to fungi. And when CD4 T cells are infected with HIV, they go it undergoes really a vicious cycle. The HIV infects CD4 T cells in the acute phase, which really kills the CD4 T cells and causes inflammation. This inflammation then recruits more CD4 T cells to continue the replication cycle. And go into that asymptomatic stage whereby it slowly depletes CD4 T cells in your body and continues that cycle over and over and over again. And when you have low CD4 counts, this leads you to be more susceptible to opportunistic infections. Infections that, if you had a healthy, strong, robust immune system, would not be of an issue. But because you're effectively becoming immunocompromised as HIV infections progress, this leads you susceptible to infections like cytomegalovirus uh, or hepatitis C. It also leaves you susceptible to bacterial infections like tuberculosis or urinary tract infections. Now, I want to take a step back from this and highlight why this type of HIV research is really important. It's important because HIV is a lifelong infection that we do not have a cure for. So it needs to be treated as soon as possible. And new antiretrovirals can help those who have acquired resistance or gotten resistant strains of HIV. And by reducing the frequency at which medication needs to be administered, this can help reduce treatment fatigue and hopefully increase antiretroviral therapy adherence so that way people can suppress HIV viral replication. Now, this brings us to the paper that we're talking about today, which is called a highly potent long-acting small molecule HIV-1 capsid inhibitor with efficacy in a humanized mouse model by Yant et al. from Gilead in Foster City, California, USA. And in this study, they investigated the utility of inhibiting capsid proteins by performing high throughput screens for small molecule capsid inhibitors and optimizing the most promising results for antiviral activity. And by doing this, they investigated one drug in particular, GSCA1. And to investigate the functions of GSCA1, they used uh, T cell culture to investigate its properties. To illustrate what resistance does, uh, they took common HIV resistant mutants and exposed them to typical HIV treatments and found that it required more of the drug to inhibit viral replication. To compare the effectiveness of GSCA1 to already known typical HIV treatments and those resistant mutants, they treated these resistant mutants with GSCA1 and found that these mutations do not negatively affect GSCA1 activity. So GSCA1 is potent against previously known therapy resistant mutations. And they also found that GSCA1 is effective against simian immunodeficiency virus and HIV2. Now the authors of this paper also investigated what happens if GSCA1 resistance arises. So they found that GSCA1 resistant mutants had mutations that spontaneously arose in this binding pocket over here. And the individual amino acids are identified in purple. They also found that this binding pocket where these mutations are occurring is also highly conserved. Now, to investigate the mechanism of action of these GSCA1 mutants and exactly what they're doing, the authors of this paper subjected HIV to GSCA1 and took the resistant mutants. They analyzed them and found that these mutants had an increased amount of aberrant folding. So these mutants have a decreased ability to infect other host cells. When investigating the mechanism of action of GSCA1, they found that this drug binds to the C-terminal domain of capsid protein. So after identifying where it binds and what these mutants do, the authors of this paper asked how is GSCA1 affecting the morphology of capsid assembly products. So they looked GSCA1 and found that GSCA1 actually disrupts tubule formation. The next question that the authors of this paper had is what part of the viral life cycle is GSCA1 specifically affecting? So they found that when adding it to the cells, they could identify 
that GSCA1 is effective at blocking early and late responses in a dose-dependent manner. They also found that comparing GSCA1 infections to a normal HIV-infected cell and common HIV drug treatments, which see that capsid and viral DNA do not associate together once inside of the cell, uh, GSCA1 actually prevents the dissociation of viral DNA and capsids. To contextualize how GSCA1 is affecting HIV infections, they used a humanized mouse model. And in this mouse model, one of the first questions they asked is, how long does GSCA1 persist? So how long will it last in the mouse? So they treated these mice with an injection of GSCA1 and found that over the course of eight weeks, GSCA1 persists for this entire time, which is great. We have evidence of a long-lasting antiretroviral therapy. To see how GSCA1 compares to a typical HIV treatment through oral antiretrovirals, shown here in green, and against another long-acting antiretroviral that is going through clinical trials in gray, they took their humanized mice and treated them with these three different treatments. So they looked at viral replication at two weeks and 12 weeks. They found that the oral antiretrovirals effectively inhibited viral replication, which we know that is what they're supposed to do. When GSCA1 was used, however, they found that it effectively limits HIV particle replication throughout the entire study. Now, to summarize everything I've said, uh, the authors of this paper found GSCA1 and tested it against common HIV treatment resistant mutations and found that GSCA1 was effective against these. They also recovered uh, GSCA1 resistant mutants and found that they had aberrant folding and had a tougher time infecting other cells. They moved these findings and contextualized them in a humanized mouse model. So by treating this mouse model with GSCA1, they found that this drug lasted for over eight weeks and inhibited viral replication over 12 weeks. Now, this information I think is pretty interesting. It's cool to see new drugs and what they do. However, this information is also significant to HIV drug development and the field of, of HIV treatment. It is significant because it shows an effective new drug that works on identified treatment resistant HIV mutants. So it gives us another tool in the arsenal. They also found that GSCA1 resistant mutants mainly show a reduced ability to infect other cells. And finally, its long lasting effect shows promise for future therapy, because if you can reduce drug fatigue and get more people on an antiretroviral therapy treatment, you can reduce the spread of HIV. Now, all science as it stands is basically a stepping stone for knowledge that is driven by questions. I had a few questions of my own when reading about this information. The first question I had is really, what is the optimal dosing for GSCA1? What do other doses do? My next question, which I kind of wish I didn't have to ask, but it's really the world that we live in, is how much will this treatment cost? How much does it cost to create GSCA1? And finally, uh, I was actually really curious about what is the rate of resistant mutations? So how long can it be used by itself? My final question though is, what do you think? What sort of ideas or questions popped into your head when hearing about this information? I'd love to hear about it in the comment section below. Also, let me know if you're interested in any particular topics so that way I can cover them in the future. Now, I hope that you learned something, but more importantly, I hope you enjoyed your time doing so. So if you did, give this video a like and subscribe for more in the future. I said at the end I would give you some information on a free NFT. So here it is. If you go over to Twitter and follow the Investigate, Explore, Discover Twitter page at Invextus and retweet the tweet about this video, I will send you a link so that way you can get a free NFT. And with that, I will see you next time.